published on the occasion of uh, 70 years of uh, International Association of Universities. When we have a book, a new book, I think the first words from the beginning uh, have to go to the editors and to the authors. So uh, Hillage, Andreas, uh, Diana, they uh, did an excellent uh, job coordinating us for almost uh, one year, one year and uh, something. And uh, finally, to have this uh, very comprehensive uh, book where we have also 82 authors. I don't have exactly here from how many countries, but uh, for sure it's a large number of uh, uh, countries represented. And uh, the books, uh, as you have seen, uh, covers uh, many topics. Today, we'll try to speak uh, in this first event about uh, the values of um, how, uh, higher education. Um, and um, at the same time, um, we'll try to, in the next uh, two uh, sessions, we'll try to cover uh, other topics. Naturally, it will not be possible to invite all the 82 uh, contributors, authors of the book, to speak today or during the three uh, sessions. But we have welcomed and uh, encouraged, and also will encourage in the future each of us as authors to do the introduction of uh, this book within our academic community. I do believe it's a valuable uh, academic um, uh, publications that should be promoted because in fact, it's not a process of discussing about a new paper or a new book. It's a, an opportunity to discuss about the role of higher education in the world and uh, to have a look on the seven decades uh, of activity of International Association of Universities and the way higher education has shaped and shaped the society, our societies. Uh, as you probably already know, this, publish was, uh, this book was published in an uh, open source uh, uh, format. And uh, as uh, Hiliji just mentioned, we have, I think, already 140,000, 130,000 downloads. I am very confident in a couple of uh, weeks uh, or months, we'll be surprised to see the number of people accessing this uh, book. Why it's important the book, not just to persuade us about higher education, the importance of higher education, but also I do believe this book should be addressed to other people outside the higher education. For example, to politicians or to different policymakers, because the university is an important part of society and university has contributed a lot to the uh, uh, change of uh, our society. And politicians have to discover uh, this. For today, I would like to thank to our uh, speakers. They are at the same time contributors to the uh, book. We'll try in a very compressed uh, way. And my example, I would like to be also considered to try to compress my presentation. So in a very compressed, short way, I invite each speaker today, its author, to speak about uh, uh, her or his uh, view on uh, the higher education topic, on the values and uh, uh, the changing landscape of higher education. Uh, each speaker will have uh, seven minutes and uh, we'll try at the end to have uh, the possibility to, for a discussion, questions and uh, answers. The first speaker today will be Joe uh, Bella, uh, Emeritus Professor and Distinguished Research Fellow, London School of Economics and the Political Science. We had for the one um, um, attending this video earlier, the possibility to uh, hear her introducing herself. She has a distinguished career in uh, higher education and playing an important role in shaping the policies of different uh, uh, universities and institutions. For example, uh, uh, I mentioned London School of Economics or um, um, uh, British Council. But um, I should uh, recognize uh, Andreas signaled me, and thank you for doing that, uh, the role of um, uh, our colleague in the fight for rights and liberty in South Africa. Again, 
uh, anti apartheid movement. Again, the voice of academics in shaping and building our uh, democracies. So Joe, very, very happy to see you today in this event and you have the floor for the next seven minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so my chapter is titled Leveling Up International Higher Education. <clears throat> and it focuses on some of the inequities uh, globally. Uh, the thinking behind this chapter came uh, when I was talking with African academics and university leaders about bringing the British Council's International Higher Education Conference going global to the African continent for the first time. And while many welcomed this, others questioned whether it was a neo-colonial exercise. Was international higher education simply an opportunity to push Western educational institutions and ideas onto a global audience. Now, I took this challenge quite seriously and started thinking and researching about it. Historically, it's acknowledged that universities can and do play an important part in the process of nation building, in technological and economic advancement, and as custodians and generators of national cultures underpinning nation states. In Africa itself, universities were a priority among post-independence countries, leader, leaders such as Julius Nyerere and Kwame Nkrumah believed higher education was critical to self-determination and towards a, na a new nation building exercise. But they also recognized that to be relevant and indeed excellent, universities also needed to be internationally connected. This was after all a generation of leaders, many of whom had been educated abroad. And in 1961, Nkrumah, speaking to the Council of the University of Ghana, newly independent from University of London, said the university would contribute to national and regional development, but also had to remain internationally connected. So I used this argument in my conversations with um, African university leaders at the time. I also said that academics are the first to argue that from time immemorial, scholars have exchanged ideas and collaborated internationally. But I also recognized that higher education is no longer simply the purview of curiosity driven scholars reaching out to each other across borders. Higher education has become internationalized also at the behest of commercial interests and spearheading this trend has been the dominance of the West with some universities behaving more like multinational corporations than places of learning. So we then looked at examples of good as well as poor practice when Going Global did indeed go to Cape Town um, in the late uh, teens, 20 teens. Um, for example, some universities do focus on profit margins when they are trying to attract international students or um, open campuses abroad, but others foster equitable partnerships. Um, some governments have deliberately cultivated transnational education to improve their own standards and research rep reputations like China and Singapore, and haven't sacrificed their autonomy. But middle income and lower income economies risk being swamped by international players and do face particular challenges keeping universities at the heart of their nation building processes. I then turned to my own disciplinary field, which is international development. And that led me to question where the global goals such as Agenda 30 helped or hindered these leaders. And I found that it wasn't particularly helpful. Most global goals have focused throughout the 20th century and well into the 21st on primary education. The best example here is the MDGs, which had the, the Millennium Development Goals, which had as their second goal to achieve universal primary education. Higher education has been ignored, the argument being that investment in higher education would subsidize the better off and would not reduce poverty. But Agenda 2030 and the accompanying Sustainable Development Goals, rather than picking off primary schooling, have adopted a holistic and systemic approach to education, and this is welcome. It constitutes a significant positive step forward, 
But I would argue, and I do argue in the chapter, that from the vantage point of nations with ambitions to grow prosperous economies and societies and wishing to compete effectively internationally, they perhaps don't go far enough. I conclude my chapter by pointing out that internationalization is a two-way street. As we enter unprecedented period, per, period shaped by challenges such as climate change, unknown viruses, and global discontent, learning from all over the world has never been so important. The treatment and management of HIV, AIDS, and Ebola in Africa has given us many ideas and much experience about how to handle global pandemics such as COVID. Rebelling against the legacy of colonialism and apartheid rule, South African students have challenged in quite, um, the colonial curriculum. And those with inquiring minds everywhere are now beginning to question the, question the nature, source and purpose of knowledge. Everywhere people are asking who owns the canon. It's an important question and it's important to acknowledge that critical thinking engendered by universities themselves is important to the building of open societies, nationally and internationally. Long may this last. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, your uh, presentation. Uh, I have uh, enjoyed uh, not just a very compressed uh, uh, picture of higher education in the last decades, but also very well underlying the challenges that we are facing uh, today. Thank you, Joe. And now uh, let me say and introduce very uh, briefly Schur Bergen for uh, two reasons. Firstly, he is very well known. Secondly, we don't have time. So if I am to say something about uh, Schur Bergen, I would say one of the very few funding fathers of the European higher education area. So sure, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ademos. Now, saying that if something does not exist, we would need to invent it, may be a cliche, but in the case of the IAU, the cliche is actually true. IAU is part and parcel of the promise of higher education, which is the topic of my chapter. The IAU is unique in being a global organization of universities and bringing together hundreds of institutions from all continents. Well, maybe except Antarctica, where the membership potential is, is more limited. And yet the most important thing is not the numbers. It's really what these hundreds of universities do together under the auspices of the IAU. Its global diversity makes the IAU a force to reckon with. And its commitment to the diverse missions of higher education makes the IAU a highly appreciated partner for the Council of Europe. When the IAU was a sprightly youth of 50, at least in Europe, um, the public debate really focused on the role of higher education in preparing for employment. And make no mistake, this is an important purpose of higher education. But the point is, it's not the only purpose. Higher education should prepare not only for the economy, but for society. And therefore, the Council of Europe has defined four major purposes of higher education. Preparation for the labor market. Preparation for life as active citizens in democratic societies. Personal development, maybe the original purpose of education, it's just that nobody talks about it anymore. And the development of a broad and advanced knowledge base. These purposes are not contradictory, they're complementary. And the, purpose, the promise of higher education is to fulfill them all. Many of the competences that make you attractive on the labor market also make you well suited to work for democracy in the public domain and they further your personal development. As an organization devoted to democracy, human rights and the rule of law, the Council of Europe is in particular concerned with the societal role of higher education because democracy is inconceivable without education. And we're talking about education 
not just training. They probably train more highly qualified specialists in more areas than ever before. But do they also educate the intellectual? People who can put their subject specific competences into broader context, ask difficult questions, and most importantly, find the answers to these difficult questions. If the answer is no, maybe not, or not quite, higher education has a serious challenge. No organization is better placed to meet that challenge than the IAU. Now that is why the Council of Europe invited the IAU to participate in the development of our reference framework of competences for democratic culture. We're grateful that the IAU accepted and that this present Secretary General, Helge van Plant, became one of the key experts in this endeavor. The reference framework of competences for democratic culture updates the traditional definition of learning outcomes. It's not only about what you know, understand, and are able to do. It's also about what you're willing to do, and therefore also about what you're able to do, but refrain from doing. That is the ethical dimension of higher education, and it's not the least important one. So competences and ethics are key to the democratic mission of higher education, another project where the IAU is a treasured partner for the Council of Europe. We have been working on the democratic mission of higher education for the past two decades with the International Consortium for Higher Education, Civic Responsibility and Democracy. The Organization of American States has now joined this cooperation and not least the IAU has now formally uh, joined the cooperation after actually having contributed to it for many, many years. And of course, we could not discuss the democratic mission of higher education without hearing the global voice of universities. For humans, 70 is an age at which our forces diminish. But for the humans that are the life and blood of the AAU, 70 is an age to look ahead and to continue to guide us on the way to democratic, sustainable societies built on knowledge and understanding, ethics, and societal responsibility. The promise of higher education may be that higher education has promises to keep and years to go before we sleep. Happy birthday, IAU. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sure. And uh, also, I would like to once again appreciate the work that you have uh, coordinated for many years in the Council of Europe on the idea of uh, citizenship, public participation, and education, uh, the responsibility of uh, our education institution in building uh, 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 democracy. Uh, I do uh, believe, if you very well underlined, uh, if we let, uh, let uh, governments and different other uh, uh, actors to consider higher education just the providers of the labor fo force, that uh, would be a very, very big mistake. And we have to uh, fight, even though I don't like the word uh, fight all the time, for the right of universities to train, to prepare, to edu educate young generations according to all this set of values. Andrew, in line in this, uh, uh, in this uh, session, in this presentation, uh, you are among the one that uh, supported uh, from the beginning the idea of uh, preparing this uh, uh, book. Uh, also, we initially considered this book as one of the component, one of the events that will be organized during the general conference in uh, uh, Dublin. As Hilich said, uh, we hope we'll do this uh, next year. Please, you have the floor to introduce your uh, voice on uh, and contribution to this book. Thanks very much, Remus. And it's a pleasure to be addressing you this afternoon uh, at the launch of this very special book. I thought that uh, the 70th anniversary of the International Association of Universities was a good opportunity to look back over the last 70 years from the lens of internationalization of higher education given that that's a major theme of the work of the IAU. 
And the, the last 70 years, when you look at it, it, has been extraordinary in terms of where we've come in human history. It's worthwhile thinking back to when the IAU was founded in the aftermath of the Second World War as part of the attempt, along with the United Nations, of forming a system that would ensure that there was never a war of that magnitude again. And just looking at what's changed since then. So I've picked out seven things which, in my view, have been significant contributors to the globalization of higher education. And of course, you, you may have your own list of things, but the seven that I've picked out are language, transport, globalization of industry and commerce, massification of higher education, the internet and social media, and university rankings. So I'd like to just say a few words about each one of those here. And for, for more detail, I'll refer you back to the chapter in the book. So the first one is language, and really it, I think it was a consequence of the World War and the fact that the US came into the World War quite late, whereas most of the stage of the World War was in Europe, in mainland Europe and uh, in Asia. So what we saw in the aftermath of the World War was that many countries within Europe were having to rebuild completely, including the UK, at a time that the US then was in a position really to capitalize on the fact that its infrastructure was intact. It had access to large amounts of fossil fuel that were very easy to get hold of. And it was able to hire in some of the best scientists from the European region during that time to build on the expertise that had been accumulated on both sides of that particular conflict and particularly the expertise around uh, jet engines, rockets, etc. So there was a time when the, the, um, uh, the, the weight of international scientific endeavor and particularly technological development swung to the US and swung to a country that was working in English. If you look prior to the Second World War, you see the scientific literature being spread across all of the major European languages. And you, you just look at the setting up of the IAU, it wasn't clear at that point that English would become the lingua franca, and that's why we are a dual language organization. But I, I think at this point in time, as a result of what happened after the Second World War, there's no question that English has become the language of science, technology, industry, and commerce. There are now twice as many second language speakers of English as there are first language speakers. And no other language has more second language speakers than it does first language speakers. So it's very clear that there is a huge distinction. Of course, there's no good reason why English should be a lingua franca. It's it, totally unsuited to that purpose. And it's an accident of history that that's come about. But by having what's effectively a lingua franca, it's opened the doors for a global higher education system. If you look at, at transport, uh, if you wanted to fly anywhere before the war or just after the war, you were in noisy, slow, propeller-driven aircraft, and there were very few commercial flights. By the 1970s, on the back of uh, jet commercial airliners, 310 million flights were taking place every year. By 2018, that had expanded to 4.2 billion flights a year, an exponential increase. And that decrease in cost of flights, increase in comfort and convenience, meant that it's much, much easier to travel around the world for the, all purposes, including higher education. As a result of both that passenger uh, transport, but also goods, the, the, the ability to move goods around the world very easily and conveniently, we've seen this globalization of industry and commerce. And again, this uh, founding of English then as the language of industry and commerce around the world. And there we can see that the GDP, in terms of the GDP exported from countries, has moved from on average 10% in 1950 to 25% now. That, that doesn't take into account of the fact that manufacturing itself has decreased as a proportion of GDP over that period of time. So huge amounts of manufacturing 
now are exported and imported rather than done within country. The, the next point that uh, I've uh, put within my chapter is the massification of higher education. And in 1950, in the UK, 3.4% of the population went on to higher education. In 2019, it was 50%. Here in Ireland, it's more than 60%. So, uh, and you can work out the figures for, for your own countries. It's increased very, very significantly since the IUA was, uh, since the IAU was set up in 1950 there. And the consequence of that is that the governments can no longer afford to fund the cost, the full cost of higher education for that number of people. Um, thanks to Remus for giving me the two minute warning. And as a result, then uh, universities have had to look more and more towards students for funding a, a portion of that education. And that opens up the door then for the possibility of educating students from without one's country in order to uh, get the fees that would then subsidize the operation of the university within country. The last point then is the rankings. And although we make a, a lot of, uh, uh, we, we say a lot about how inaccurate these rankings are, they've made universities look around the world at what other universities are doing and learn from that and learn from best practice within those universities. So those are the seven drivers that, that I, I could see for the globalization of higher education that has occurred over the period, over the lifetime of the IAU. And we now have the opportunity to use the connectivity that we have to address the challenges which are facing the world and particularly the sustainability challenges. So I think we need to learn from what has gone before us, but to, to then utilize the network that we've developed to address the threat to the future, that the use of fossil fuels to allow everything that I've just talked about to happen presents. So with that, I'll uh, conclude. Thanks, Remus. Thank you, Andrew. Your uh, paper, your presentation is uh, a clear uh, proof of the fact that the history of uh, education, higher education, is in fact uh, the history of the world. The history of research is the history of the world progress. The history of academic mobility is the history of globalization of today. Uh, so thank you for reminding us uh, uh, that and underlying once again, the role of universities during the uh, century. Harvard University, I didn't understand exactly if it's graduate school of education, but uh, however, it's a place where I had the chance for a couple of time to discuss with other international uh, scholars about the role of education. So I look, uh, I look forward to hear uh, your opinions about uh, the value of um, uh, high civic role of university education in the age of competition and rapid change Mania, you have the floor. Thank you, Remus. Uh, I'm honored to join this celebration of the 70th anniversary of the International Association of Universities um, and the celebration of this distinguished book that, uh, uh, that uh, the editors have guided us to put together. Um, in, the essay that I'm presenting has been written together with Pedro Teixeira from University of Porto. And we have focused specifically on the civic role of university education. Uh, so we have linked it there where Schurbergen before mentioned uh, the education for active citizenship in democratic uh, societies and, and thereby going beyond the more narrow vision of the economic benefits of higher education. Um, in the essay, we take a very uh, scholarly approach of reviewing the literature that exists and research that exists that shows uh, the positive effects of higher education on uh, improvement in voting behavior, more, uh, higher education, more educated individuals, more likely they are to vote, on community engagement or civic engagement, on tolerance of others, in trust in institutions. So there's a lot of evidence from research that shows those kind of a positive impact of higher education, even though they are not perfect, of course. 
Um, and then we discuss, so how do universities achieve this through education? And we point to the two schools of thought that exist. One is through classical education, through classical liberal learning, where students are prompted to engage with classical texts um, and deliberate on those texts but removed from the, or disengaged from the current uh, political realities. And then there is a progressive uh, school of thought that urges students to actually head on engage with the contemporary social realities and that promotes action-centered pedagogies. What we see in the reality, of course, is a, a combination of both approaches taking place in the university uh, education. And what we also see is that there is pretty much general agreement that the education for civic mindedness, for active citizenship in democratic society should not be something that is an add on element, not even an add on course on civics, but rather that it is something that is inherent across the uh, teaching and all universities mission. So in the same vein, we also argue that uh, education for civic mindedness does not only happen within the classroom, but also equally happens within the universities. And sure will know this expression as well as uh, colleagues from the International Association of Universities in the universities as sites of citizenship and civic uh, engagement. So we are uh, advocating there for uh, creating opportunities for students for civic engagement, for public service uh, through uh, not only curricular, but also co-curricular co and extracurricular activities. And what we are also speaking about is that universities themselves have to be uh, enacting student political agency by allowing them to participate in the uh, decisions or within the governance of higher education institutions. So we are talking about the Mitbestimmung, the co-decision as well, involving students so that they can practice uh, citizenship already in the course of the university, not only learn about uh, citizenship and civic engagement. So finally, we, we really argue that the growing erosion of trust and social bonds and increased political po polarization that we see across democratic societies are even a reasons more for the universities to take on the function uh, to nurture civic val values and promote uh, democratic citizenship. In fact, we are arguing that uh, universities and all higher education institutions are one of the uh, few remaining uh, institutions, social institutions that have the capacity and have the vitality to do so. So this is where our, uh, our essay ends. Maybe if I just have one more minute to add additional point here, have it from the you know from the contemporary developments that we see in the campuses especially in the campuses in the us um, perhaps it would be important to emphasize that one single most important um, civic mindedness that we should be impairing or helping our students to develop is really to be able to deal with the intellectual disagreements uh, intellectually, so debate and discuss across the differences, because the, inter the intellectual disagreements, um, the dialogue across the political differences is at the heart of the democracies, whereas the disability we deal with the agreements and a culture without proper dialogue is really what is distinct of the, uh, of the dictatorships. And uh, we see a lot of incidents right now across the campuses, especially in the United States, where students uh, are failing on that grounds. And I think it's a responsibility for us as teachers um, to perso person personify this uh, intellectual open-mindedness um, and fair presentation of all views and the respect for viewpoint uh, diversity. And in a similar way, it's the responsibility for the universities to demonstrate intellectual openness by facilitating debates on contentious issues with speakers across the political spectrum uh, to emphasize the civil discourse across the differences. And yes, in fact, to nurture tolerance. And uh, I'll, I'll just add uh, what comes into this mission as well is of course protection of the free speech as the lifeblood of the all of the missions 
of the university, of the critical and free inquiry of learning from the diversity uh, of, uh, of vibrant intellectual, uh, intellectual uh, life. And, and of course, the free speech is also the lifeblood uh, of the democracies. So this is uh, kind of my little add on, but uh, thank you uh, again for having me and congratulations to International Association of Universities uh, for, its, uh, for its work in this area as, as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mania. I do agree, and we know this. If you want to measure the temperature of our societies 10 years by now, let's measure the temperature of universities today. So our universities today and the kind of debates and discussion and conflict and the competition of ideas will represent a, somehow the reflection of the debates in our society a couple of years later. Excellent. Thank you very much for uh, your contribution to the book. Uh, Mandla, Your Excellency, dear Mr. President, former president of International uh, uh, Council for Distance Education, we, I met you first time in Australia a couple of years ago when we were discussing about distance learning as something specific. After a couple of years and due to this COVID situation, distance learning, online learning became standard. So I'm very curious to see your uh, uh, view today on the topic. Mandla, you have the floor. No, 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 thank, thank you so much. Uh, just to say once again, in line with all the, the speakers, you know, that uh, we have to congratulate the IAU, you know, for this milestone, which is actually excellent and very exciting. You know, just to say that um, the chapter, of course, from my side that I penned, you know, uh, looks, you know, in that sense on the question of change, you know, where I'm arguing that the only constant in life, you know, is change. Uh, and then this remains true, of course, you know, it is rather the scale and impact of that change that will then distinguish the routine, you know, from the radical and the evolution from the revolution. But we have to look in this instance, in the context of what then I pursue in that regard, on the question of higher education in its current, you know, state of disruption, which is in a sense, you know, forcing us to revisit everything uh, that we know and believe about education in pursuit of its continued relevance, you know, and sustainability as a new normal. You know, I mean, you've just spoken about uh, distance education and uh, you, you try to look in a stricter sense of the word on the developments, you know, that have happened, you know, within um, the recent, you know, uh, 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 months, you know, um, of higher education in the world, you know, that has suddenly, you know, found itself being enveloped, you know, by COVID-19. The speed at which things happened, you know, I view that and argue that it was in a sense, a quantum leap into a new normal, you know, that uh, we are talking about, you know, at this day and age. So the key contributors, of course, then to this uh, disruption, uh, I want to argue is this fundamental influ influential shifts in geo-socio-economic and political practices, you know, this rampant technological and scientific innovation uh, that involves the multiplicity of uh, players here that of course include us as higher education, but you find that there are other players, you know, outside higher education, you know, that have come into this domain, you know, largely as a result of the opportunities uh, that they are seeing, you know, that they can bring to bear in our own space. Now, the question then that arises is the extent to which we begin then to view uh, the nature and value of a university within the context, you know, of uh, 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 the needs and demands that must consistently appeal to the whole notion of equity, social justice, and redress. So what I'm then um, examining from the chapter is to contend on the four key drivers you know, of this current drive of transformation in higher education. And I argue that uh, this needs then to be uh, attended to uh, with an understanding that it will then ensure relevance and sustainability within our own space. And among these, I'm talking one of codependence, borderless 
yet profoundly unequal and conflicted global societies. And secondly, I'm speaking of the changing nature, relevance and value of knowledge. And then thirdly, I'm speaking of the growing redundancy and harsh reality of the current business and delivery models. And then finally, I'm speaking of the new models, you know, of organizational design and, and leadership. So, I mean, in, in the context of speaking about these matters, um, I just want us to look into uh, where we were 70 years ago and the values of the uh, International Association of uh, Universities and the extent to which those values, you know, began in a sense, you know, to assist us as we shaped, you know, our own sector, you know, and then looking then at, at this current time that we're finding ourselves in and acknowledging, of course, that as an organization, to what extent are we not oblivious, you know, of the changes and the question marks that can be raised in some quarters as to whether indeed as high education, we may be considered, you know, as a, a, a appealing to the common good, you know, or as a common good as it were, you know, um, are we talking about a situation where this common good um, that is about high education, you know, uh, was it intended for everyone else? Or is this common good for a certain sector, as it were, you know, within our own societies that happen to have those kinds of opportunities as a result of uh, 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 having access to resources and then those without access to such resources, you know, finding themselves and of course uh, on the margins. And I'm then saying that um, you then see that the extent to which as public universities, we own up to these particular values, you know, is something that uh, of course has to go hand in hand with the support that we expect from our own governments. But to what extent are we experiencing across the globe a situation where the resources at our disposal are, are dwindling on, on, on an ongoing basis and the extent to which that affects you know, that which we are trying to achieve in this instance, you know, uh, because they defend themselves on an ongoing basis in this regard. And of course, how open are we on the question of access, on the question of knowledge and so on and so forth. So these are questions that uh, of course are ongoing and we need to um, uh, uh, get involved and engage, you know, as we move on as a higher education sector. So that, let me just end it there, you know, because the bulk of everything else that one's talk, talk about appears in the chapter that I contributed in the book. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for uh, for uh, your presentation. But also, let me to add something. I remember when I was uh, minister of education in uh, the Romanian government. Sometimes there were different discussions, and uh, at one moment, a colleague said, "What do you know, the academics? You stay just with your books, and you are a theoretical uh, theoretical people." So thank you, Mandla, for being not just an academic. And it's important to have someone to build conceptually uh, uh, different models, but also for your practical and very touchable work to build peace in your region. For the one who doesn't know, uh, Mandla just returned from um, a negotiation in uh, uh, the region of uh, South Africa in order to build peace in a larger uh, uh, community. So thank you very much for your uh, uh, work. And uh, Saulius, if I pronounced uh, correctly, your presentation, Changing Role of uh, Universities in Lithuanian Society, I have the feeling somehow I, I, I know what you are going to say because I do have seen, I have seen the role of Romanian universities in changing Romanian society, especially both our countries had to, uh, to move from a, a communist regime to a democratic regime. So please uh, excuse me if I um, presented uh, maybe not uh, in the correct uh, framework your presentation, but I do know the role of academics in the uh, moments of uh, uh, um, huge 
transformative change. So you have the floor. Maybe the mic. Thank you, Remus. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you were right. Uh, our countries uh, really have many similarities. And uh, I will present the case study of Lithuania. The essay was written together with the rector of Mykolas Romilis University, Professor Inga Jalini. The Lithuanian Republic was reestablished in 1990 after the fall of the USSR marking the beginning of a wave of reforms in the country's higher education sector. In taking its first steps as an independent country, Lithuania faced many serious challenges. As for the universities, they were expected to play the vitally important role of preparing professionals for a completely new economic system and a changing society. The early years following the reestablishment of Republic of Lithuania has been referred to as the so-called wild economy stage, which was characterized by weak institutions, poor legal regulation, and law enforcement that lacked the means to enforce. Yet the country managed to get back on its feet with young people acknowledging the value of higher education and considering their university education. This coincided with a global trend of massification, which was uh, uh, already mentioned uh, in this forum in another occasion, which received a boost and particularly it was seen in Central and Eastern Europe, but also uh, around uh, Europe and around the world. Politicians and even some education experts were quick to point out that in their view, higher education massification resulted in the overall decline in quality and graduates are struggling to find employment in their chosen field. There was, however, a more objective view underpinned by data which showed that most Lithuanians wanted to secure tertiary qualification. Indeed, such was the demand for skilled workers that wages were twice those of unskilled workers. From 2011, Lithuania's higher education sector was faced with decline in number of students entering higher education, a trend common in many other EU countries. In the case of Lithuania, certain factors were also at work. The country was facing a serious demographic crisis due to declining birth rates and immigration. This was, this was compounded by the government's declared goal of raising the quality of higher education, which in practice meant restricting, restricting student access. It should also be noted that the so-called lowest entry score has reduced access to higher education as graduates from schools with lower quality of education have lost access to higher education. Such schools are generally attended by children from less affluent families. Nevertheless, despite problems and issues, Lithuanian universities are some of the most advanced institutions in the country and continue to consolidate their reputations on the international stage, maintain high standards of transparency, continuously change and improve, as well as contribute significantly to the country's development. In 2018, the employment rate for tertiary educated young adults in Lithuania was 93, which is higher than the OECD average and the highest across OECD countries. The same can be said on, of wages, the pay gap between skilled and unskilled workers in Lithuania being the largest in the EU. Lithuania's growth in innovation is the highest in the European region and has reached about 20% over the last decade. During the COVID-19 crisis, it became clear that Lithuanian universities were quickly ad adapting to the new conditions and moving smoothly to the remote mode. A number of important issues need to be addressed if higher education is continued to grow and contribute to the country's development. These issues, these issues include understand and evaluate the significance of higher education in broader sense, its impact 
reaches beyond countries' economic development and affects the society, national culture, quality of life in broader sense. State focus on innovation and exchange of expertise, knowledge and research findings between higher education institutions, businesses, and other market participants. Extend access to higher education in particular and recognize its substantial role in promoting wider inclusion by all groups in the community. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, because uh, comparative uh, approach is all the time important, let me share very briefly with you. After the revolution in Romania, for almost 15 years, the prime ministers of Romania were university professors, the members of the constitutional court were university professors, legislations, the main pieces of legislation, the constitution was written by university professors. So just very simple examples of how in our countries, in this part of Europe, practically universities have, have helped uh, uh, our uh, countries to do this move to democracy and the European Union. So, quite excellent uh, uh, time schedule. <laughs> so we are just three minutes uh, late, two minutes late comparing with uh, the, what we initiated, uh, what we considered initially. I would kindly ask uh, Hilij if she wants to uh, join me in managing this uh, uh, question answer uh, session. I have to recognize, I don't know exactly how we will do if our colleagues, participants to this debate have the chance to ask directly or we use uh, chat. So Hilij, if you can uh, give us uh, help. Thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking all of uh, the speakers for their uh, wonderful intervention. Thank you also for the warm words for the IAU. It puts a lot of pressure on us, but good one. We have to continue the work <laughs> for at least this, the next 70 years, if I understand correct. So um, Andreas uh, and, and uh, <laughs> members of the board, please, let's make sure we can do that uh, all together with the global higher education community. I see also many of the other authors in the chat, so maybe some of them would wish to add a few words uh, in the Q&A, or if any of the participants would have a question to, uh, to our speakers here today. The presentations are very different, yet they have in common one particular thing. It is to reassert and reaffirm the, the strong role of higher education for society and for the transformation of society and what uh, how it needs to be uh, emphasized that uh, the, the sector and the institutions in their broad variety have many different roles to play, but they have a central role to play. It is to educate for, uh, for well, critical thinking, for uh, civic engagement, for uh, a role for society. Uh, I don't know if, if any of the uh, speakers would like to react to any of the other presentations to start because that's also an opportunity maybe to enter into the dialogue that is much needed on these very, very important topics that are uh, not small. And unfortunately, maybe if I may say it, put it in that, that way, need more attention even today than in the past years. And we, we would have hoped though that the pandemic somehow, or at least that's what from the IEU we would see, that people see that we have to stay closer to each other, that we are in this together, that we have transformed the world for the better, etc. But we see also a lot of the contrary dynamics that are popping up all around the world. And so what is the role that uh, universities can play to help uh, move us into a better future together and indeed live up to the expectations and those promises that you've been debating in your chapters? So I'm, 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 I'm trying to pull this all together, not, not, an, uh, not an easy task, but maybe uh, if I may ask uh, any of you and starting, uh, always difficult, but let me start with Andrew. Would you like to maybe react to any of the presentations that were made uh, here today? Well, I, I think that what the presentations show is, is the wide range of contributions that higher education makes uh, to society and the, the need for us to, to pull together 
in order to uh, ensure that going forward we overcome some of the challenges which uh, you've referred to there, uh, Hillage, in terms of some of the uh, uh, geopolitical pressures which are pushing back against globalization at this time and pushing back uh, unadvisedly. Now, I think that what we're seeing in this part of the world as we look across uh, the Irish Sea at the UK and look at the difficulties that they've got themselves into uh, through, through Brexit and a range of other measures where now their supply lines are breaking down. And we see the, the huge queues outside petrol stations, we see supermarkets with shelves empty of certain products and basically a, a difficult way forward in uh, achieving the sense uh, or the, the degree of globalization that's happened to this point in time, and uh, I referred to some of the drivers there, we've uh, reached a, a point of, of no return. And I think the politicians that have moved to try to move back against globalization and, and satisfy perhaps uh, popular um, opinions within their own countries are now finding just how difficult that is and effectively how it is impossible. So I think that part of the duty we have as uh, educators going forward is to ensure that our graduates appreciate the value of globalization and the value of working together uh, towards a better world. Thank you so much. I see that uh, Manya, you would wish to come in the conversation here as well, and then sure. And I also see from uh, the side of the participants, Gulam Mohamed Bai would like to come in. Thank you. I only have a question to follow up on what Sa uh, Saulius and then Remus spoke about. Uh, I too come from a country, from Slovenia, which uh, has, which constitutes has been written by the academics. In fact, the entire higher education law has been written by the academics. Pavel Zgaga is among the participants as well. Um, so there was a lot of the agency, right, from the academics in the nation building. My question to, uh, to both of them and perhaps to all of them is, is there a role there for universities as actors, not only the individual academics, not only for the students and their political agency, but is there an actorhood for the universities guided by directors and the vice rectors and the vice chancellors to have a role in uh, maintaining the democracy or in, uh, in preventing illiberal practices or, and what and how that kind of role can be played out. So I'm really posing a question about the actorhood of universities as institutions rather than um, its main constituencies, academics uh, and, and students in the preservation and consolidation of democracies and maybe in prevention of illiberal uh, trends that we see right now. Thank you. So maybe Saulius, or you would wish to, to come in there, or Shur, uh, or even Manla, so Saulius. Thank you. It's a very important question. And uh, for Lithuania, it was even more actual than in some other uh, Central and Eastern European countries, because we, are, we were the part of the, the uh, Soviet Union. So uh, social sciences were depressed actually, and uh, uh, democracy needed many sciences, many students, uh, particularly in this field. And uh, my uh, university was established uh, in 90, 1990 as uh, University of Social Sciences, and it played a very huge role in the formation of new society, because uh, on the, one, uh, on the one hand, uh, the students uh, uh, like uh, chose to, cho to, cho to choose uh, social sciences, uh, but on the other hand, uh, we, we have to establish uh, the uh, social sciences, which were part of the European tradition. Uh, now, of course, uh, the, uh, this role of universities remain. And particularly in this uh, difficult time, uh, we have not addressed uh, many issues yet, but we see what happens in, 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 in the world. Uh, the uh, university auto autonomy is under threat and uh, uh, academic freedom uh, is issue again in many 
universities in, in, in different parts of the world. So again, our uh, academic societies uh, have part in, in this and uh, have, uh, I think that not to, to struggle or not to interfere, but uh, more like to uh, propose a scientific uh, view and promote uh, values, democratic values. Thank you. Sure. I think this speaks to your the heart and soul of your work. Absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, and, and thank you very much, Salius. Um, I would, well, first of all, thank Manya for bringing in the notion of uh, this you know, university societal citizenship and also call for, let's say, more space for genuine intellectual debate. I would like to link that actually to one of Andrew's uh, seven factors, namely language. And I think to me, language has two dimensions here uh, with a link to citizenship. The first, of course, is that the academic community needs to be able to explain what we're doing in terms that make this understandable also for non-specialists. Um, and I think that is really, uh, when you asked about the university as actors, so certainly the community, the academic community as actors in societal debate relies on us being able to um, explain the need to uh, the need for knowledge and understanding, but also say the need for uh, thinking beyond the immediate time horizons, etc. Um, part of our challenge today with the rise of populism is exactly the absence of respect for uh, an understanding of the importance of, of knowledge and understanding. But the other aspect, I think it's Andrew is half right. Andrew is certainly right in pointing to the emergence of English as a lingua franca and the importance of that for international communication. But I think the other part of that story is also that academic exchange um, has contributed to an understanding of the importance of our linguistic and cultural diversity. Um, so I would also see a very important role for higher education in general, but also for academic exchange and developing competence in a range of languages, one of which is certainly English, uh, but we would lose something if the lingua franca were not uh, accompanied by a proficiency in the number of other uh, languages uh, whose use may be less widespread, but whose importance uh, is nonetheless, uh, is not less important. Thank you. I couldn't agree more, but I should uh, let uh, Andrew speak to that. But uh, indeed, the whole work that we've uh, done also together with Shure and many uh, here in the room is on uh, intercultural learning and dialogue. And it's uh, through languages that you can access the reality of the others as well and, and better connect to the different cultures around the world. And if we don't do that, we would flatten the world uh, out instead of uh, leveraging on the many opportunities and the beauty of the world itself. But do you want to add something to that, Andrew? <laughs> no, just to, to say that I agree, agree entirely and that the, the use of uh, English as a lingua franca, uh, it, it actually, the, in the end, the native English speakers are the ones disadvantaged because they're, they're speaking a version of English which is not necessarily the lingua franca and think that they're, they're understanding and being understood, but, but in the end aren't. So I, I totally agree that one of the things we need to be pursuing is that everyone has at least two languages and that helps in terms of, of global communication. Uh, I guess my point was simply the uh, practicalities of having a language which is a lingua franca around the world that we can have our, our meetings at the International Association of Universities in a language which uh, educated people from around the world can can use and uh, interact in. So uh, I'm in, fully in agreement and yes I was only presenting one half of the picture there and I, I agree with you. <laughs> Mandla, would you like to react to this? Well, I, I, I agree totally, you know, with uh, what my colleagues have actually indicated. Uh, the, the whole question of the language, you know, plays a critical role because remember that when we talk about the whole notion, you know, of uh, development, it is associated with the, the culture and identity 
you know, of those that you are actually bringing in. So the question of inclusivity then becomes part and parcel of the manner in which we then approach the subject. You know, so it is within that context, because remember that what we are pursuing within uh, 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 the IAU is to expand our networks uh, rather than actually limit, you know, that participation. So the extent to which we are plugging ourselves in is the one that comes, you know, almost naturally when the question of language is taken into account. So that is why I'm in full agreement with them. Yeah, very nice. I was uh, very pleased to take part as a keynote uh, speaker just recently at the USAF uh, conference, uh, which really brought many different cultures together from uh, the uh, southern part of Africa, but South Africa more particularly so, where also this whole notion of how do you connect to the others uh, was on the one hand, um, focusing on a need to, to, to grow um, a better understanding of the local and then better connect with the global. And that comes uh, also through this connection uh, via languages. I would like to give the floor to Gulam Mohamed Vai. I see he's not able to unmute himself, but I'm sure that Isabel Toman behind the scenes can help. There we go. Okay, thank you very much, Ligji. I hope uh, you can hear me. Um, yeah, and we will also try to see you possibly. I don't no, know. That's okay. If you don't see me, that's not important. Okay. As long as you can, as long as yes, you can hear. Can. Well, first of all, congratulations uh, to IAU on this remarkable book that has been produced on the promise of higher education, and uh, congratulations to all the speakers uh, this afternoon for their remarkable interventions. Um, it's very interesting to read the book and read the. Uh, what the various, uh, you know, authors have written about it. But when you see the people in person and get their perspectives, it makes such a big difference. And I'm so glad that uh, we've managed to hear uh, some, some of the authors of the essays in that book. I, uh, my essay in, in, in that book takes a slightly different angle. Um, and the message is that, yes, there is a promise of higher education. We need to keep that promise, but there, but there is a big but. And the but is it requires people, it requires good governance, it requires sincerity, it requires democracy. And if you, although I really, my essay is all about one man, um, Professor Walter Kamba, who was the uh, first uh, president of the IAU from Africa, also the first black um, vice chancellor of University of Zimbabwe. Here we have a man who helped in, uh, uh, assisting with the constitution of his own country when he got, you know, when Zimbabwe became uh, independent, who left a, a really very, very fruitful academic career in the United Kingdom, went back to Zimbabwe to see and to see how he can improve his own university and his own country. He sacrificed everything to do that. When he went there, after a few years, he realized that he's fighting a, a you know, a lost battle. He did try, but he did not succeed. And the reason is basically because of poor governance, because of corruption, because of the lack of democracy in his own country. And I think that's a message, an important message for us. If we are going to keep the promise of higher education, we need good people, we need good governance in the universities, but also in the country, in public universities, but also in the country. Otherwise, it is not going to happen. So that is the message that I think my essay tries to communicate. Uh, Walter Kamba was a remarkable academic, um, but he was a man who, uh, the title of my essay is a man of conscience. He is a man, he was a man of conscience, he's passed away now. And he did everything he could to uh, have integrity, to make sure that everything goes well, but he could not fight with corruption. He could not fight with power with Mugabe's power of the country, and he gave up. Unfortunately, he had to give up. And we have what we have today, the Zimbabwe we have today. A university is a reflection of the society after all. And when he left, the country started to uh, crumble. And, and, and we have the situation in Africa of Zimbabwe of what eventually turned out to be. So that was, well, that was the message. It's, it's looking back rather than looking ahead, but with a clear message that uh, universities need good governance, good people 
to uh, at the head of them, but also the countries need good governance and good people at the helm to be able to move forward and for higher education to be, keep its promise. Thank you, Hilik. Thank you, Gulam. You are uh, not only one of the authors of the book, but you're also one of the past presidents of the International Association of Universities. And these are the points you've always made and uh, contributed also to the work of the IAU. Um, uh, the importance of people, sincerity, um, eth ethics and good governance. And so that's what you've brought, uh, not only there, but also later as Secretary General uh, to the African Association of Universities. So thank you for that work and you continue. Uh, you will remember that also with the contribution, uh, it was sure who contributed, but others as well from many different platforms that uh, we sure it was ETINET, the, the European platform for ethics in higher education. With the IAU, we devoted one of the uh, issues of IAU Horizons to corruption in higher education. Education. It was quite amazing to see uh, what uh, the different points of views were. At the same time, it was also very interesting to note that uh, universities themselves had a uh, hard time taking their pen and pencils and write a paper. So we got more the perspectives of the organizations than from the institutions themselves. And that in itself tells us also something. So maybe we need to have a, a next uh, issue uh, of Horizons in the future, again, on that very topic, because indeed, uh, without good governance, if I may, people if I may we cannot it, move. Yes. I would like to add something uh, uh, in continuation of uh, what uh, Gulam said. I read and I really was very happy to, to, to read the contribution of uh, Gulam. And uh, it was, uh, for me, another proof of the fact that if we are really to count or to present the outcomes of the work of IAU after 70 years, fortunately, we are not able to do it because there are so many things that have happened due to IAU. For example, this example, this is an example underlined by Gulam. It's a, a proof of the symbolical power of IAU. A president of IAU didn't accept to broke the, the um, uh, not to respect any longer one of the fundamental value of um, uh, universities, uh, uh, university autonomy. When he was asked to do another way around by a politician, he said no. And as Gulam said, uh, uh, he practically sacrificed, uh, 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 sacrificed everything. Uh, uh, moving entirely from the country with his entire uh, uh, family, but sending a very clear public message in Zimbabwe. I cannot accept this. And also in my contribution, I'm trying to underline uh, this. Uh, sure, IAU, the Secretariat, has done a lot. Today is doing a lot of things, but there are moments when you don't really know how much good you are doing and how the ripples of the work of IAU are affecting society. And uh, in my contribution, I give somehow even my example. I discovered the world of higher education in the book published, handbook published uh, annually by IAU. So in the era of no internet for Romania, I learned about uh, universities in Europe, in Belgium, in France, uh, and finally, I applied and I studied in such a university because I had the access in a library to an old version of uh, uh, the book published by uh, IAU. So these are contributions which uh, uh, for sure we have to acknowledge. And for this reason, I enjoyed a lot uh, the contribution of Gulam to the book. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's fun work, but it's not only IU. It's all the it's the higher education sector at large. It's the partners. It's the universities in it. It's the members of the board. It's uh, our dear friends as well, because that's the fun part. Of it. It's not only uh, about hard work. It's also about the new kinds of friendships and and the the in intellectual connections around the world that are being built, uh, and that really uh, transcend. Uh, frontiers and barriers and uh, overcome uh, many of the challenges that we see uh, other ways. Um, I do not see specific questions in the chat or other people who would wish to take the floor. Um, but maybe I think Pavel, you've been, uh, you've been, you've been uh, um, uh, called almost to the table by Manja. Would you like to add something here? Because uh, 
that if I don't know if you can and if Isabel can give you the floor if you would wish, but you would wish you would need to raise the, the hand or maybe uh, any of the, the, the other uh, participants. So please do raise your hand if you would wish to contribute to question here. So Pavel, you've raised your hand. Yes, you're coming in. Yes, hello. <laughs> Yeah, now you see my picture, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah, I don't know if Isabel can also give you uh, the access to the camera. I don't know that. Okay, at least at least you see my black box. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Join this panel. And we could I, hear you. Yes. Yes. Good. yes. <laughs> um, now I only click. That's me. <laughs> Hello. So it's so interesting to listen this this uh, this afternoon. Um, and what is most important on my side, this is that I received the book right today. Postman <laughs> rang at eight o'clock, and the book is in my hand right now. So the feeling is very very different from that PDF on the screen. So once again, congratulations to everyone who contributed to this book and most, first of all, of course, to, to, to people at uh, IAUU. Uh, not to take too much of your time, uh, but yes, I, 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 uh, I heard the, the, the question uh, by Manja, and I think this is an important question related also to the, to the previous discussion in the, in the panel. So about actorhood uh, and universities, uh, hmm, uh, I, 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 even before uh, I was thinking how to, how to uh, actually articulate an answer to this question, uh, but basically this would be yes and no. Uh, mm, as we know, uh, in postmodern period, uh, there is no single idea of university. We read uh, Ron Barnett and similar and similar books, isn't it? Yeah, so, and in this way, and to make it more practical, I would say in this postmodern or whatever it is, a period, uh, it depends very much on the mission of university, of a particular university. And there is, it's, it's not written, uh, 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 at least not it, forever, what will this mission be? A university may change its mission from time to time, or let me say, from 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 one uh, uh, team to another team, and so on. What I like to remember, and this is, let me say, my early experience of uh, actorhood, university's actorhood. This is, I am 68th generation, by the way, <laughs> uh, and uh, there were. Uh, there was student, strong student radical movement also at my university. And what I really like to remember, it is that the Senate of my university supported student rebels, which was a little bit difficult to understand, in particular in a socialist country of that time. But this was the fact. And this was a part of that actorhood. So there is students have many to say about ethical problems in the society, about social inequalities in the society and so on. And scholars, we cannot deny that they say that also because this is a part of their seminarium in social sciences. But it was, never, it, it, it was not always so. So the mission may change. And what uh, I see today, I'm not speaking uh, straightforward about my university, but generally, and this was mentioned by, by the forum, by some speakers in the forum, that nowadays it's not so rare to uh, experience universities as neutral to the outside society, because this makes my career easier. It's important to collect points for high impact journals, uh, papers, and it is not important at all, maybe even problematic, if uh, 
a university, a member of university staff, or maybe student on the other side in other uh, context, uh, uh, takes actorhood too strongly, if I may say so. So, and I think this is one of the points we should discuss in, in the second decade of the third millennium and think about uh, university as responsible for the society and not only society being responsible for the university. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Uh, because the question was also addressed to me and because the university, my university has a very clear name, National University of Political Studies and Public Administration. So we are in the sector of, uh, uh, you know, a school of government. Uh, as uh, you said uh, already, uh, it's very difficult to um, have a position as an institution, but we do have, we do have, not daily, it's not our job, not even weekly, but from time to time, it's normal to send a message which will not be a political message to the society and to politicians. And it was mentioned access and equity. Uh, it was uh, uh, also, uh, 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 there are many, many uh, debates related to some public policies where we interfere with our expertise. There are laws in Romania or public policies implemented, which started as a draft prepared by our university, put on the table of governments, as support and afterwards it was the job of politicians or of the parliament to do further the idea. So we do try to have a, a, a contribution, but we are very careful our positions not to be considered as trying to influence a political um, um, balance, a political fight or, or whatever. Uh, sure, we all have options, political options, political beliefs, but we are not allowed to express this using the university uh, 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 positions. So, uh, Hilich, if, uh, if there are other people willing to, to ask uh, for the floor, uh, as uh, Hilich said, you just uh, raised the hand, we still have a couple of uh, minutes, uh, seven minutes, here we conclude the session. I would like to give the floor quickly to Andreas and Diana. Yeah. Diana is outside, I see. <laughs> and Andreas, who's inside with us here at the office, since they're the, the two uh, uh, very important actors mm -hmm. behind the book, and they may wish to uh, come in and, uh, and say a few things. And before people start to leave, because I know people are very busy as well, the other sections of the book will allow to address many other topics as well that you will find in the different chapters. And we have two uh, other webinars planned. The next one is on Thursday this week in the afternoon. And the third one will be on the anniversary day uh, um, and the date of this, the original signature of the constitution of the IAU again on 9 December, uh, but this time not in 1950, but in 2021. So we hope to welcome many of you there as well for further discussions on the other important points that the different authors will have raised. So um, Andreas and Diana, um, please, the floor is yours. So I will start with Diana because I see you're outside before the wind takes you away. There you go. Uh, thank you so much and uh, good afternoon everyone. I'm in Ljubljana actually uh, for a conference just arrived uh, from Bucharest. Uh, the weather is perfect and I'm very, very happy to, to actually be with you. I've, uh, I've listened carefully the presentations. Uh, I, for me, it was a joy to actually be part of this project. And once again, my deepest thanks to, to all the contributors, to the wonderful team at the IEU for this wonderful opportunity of uh, joining uh, the team and uh, 
be part of these uh, 70 years uh, anniversary project. Um, from my side, I just uh, I just hope that uh, we will have the chance uh, of, uh, of of having a really sustainable future for uh, for higher education uh, institutions and have IEU uh, as much as possible close to to all these challenges because definitely there is uh, much wisdom to uh, to come from this uh, type of cooperations. So once again, from my side and from Ljubljana as well. Uh, uh, a very warm thank you for uh, for everyone who has contributed to this book and by all means happy birthday uh, <laughs> uh, IEU thank you once again thank you Andreas I couldn't have said it better so Diana I completely follow in your footsteps uh, it's a uh, it's been a so far a wonderful journey I have to say it's been a long journey over, over the last uh, uh, one and a half years and the conceptualization of this book and then uh, reaching out to the authors and uh, you all know uh, that uh, editing editing a book is a, is a is a very long process and it's been wonderful to actually come to fruition uh, so I completely echo what Diana has just said um just to come back, maybe because I do see that we still have two or three minutes. Uh, there is a fascinating debate, and uh, just listening to you and uh, and and and, and uh, Manya, you 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 asked of uh, the, the the actionhood of, of universities, and this year you came in with the ethical backbone of universities and their role. And uh, uh, Joe came up with the nation building and uh, the juxtaposition of nation building and globalization, and uh, the questions coming out of that. And uh, Andrew, of course, with your seven examples of internationalization, indeed, or factors. Uh, a question that is coming to me, if I can turn around uh, the question of um, national interests and universities. Uh, we've been talking about the civilizing aspect of universities so far, the, the, the civilizing role, so to speak, it has. But my question is also, we see more and more national competition. We see more and more universities competing with each other. We see governments investing in universities in order to garnish patents, to, to garnish intellectual property, to uh, to advance on in technology uh, and, and you see uh, that the universitas you know the universal role of universities is really under fire and this also has to do with the universities themselves so my question to you is in terms of university leaders within these contexts what can universities do in order to provide for the national interest for provide for the regional interest i'm looking here also at uh, sewer and, uh, and and the concept of europe um, but at the same time, also provide for the universality of knowledge and science. Thanks. I would like to take that <laughs> comprehensive question. Uh, I, uh, I, because I started uh, the chair and I promised to be on time, I will answer, uh, Andrew, uh, and uh, I will share with you, I know exactly the way to answer, not the answer. The way to answer is to organize another session, maybe another book project for one year, one year and a half, because this issue of leadership in higher education is very, very complex. And if on different topics, we have common approaches in Australia, Europe or United States, on the topic of leadership of universities, for sure, we, we have different approaches. And don't forget there are countries where the, where the rector of a university is appointed by the president or by the prime minister, while there are countries where the president of the university is elected, like, you know, um, by all members of the community. So the concept of leadership, uh, even though the word is the same, leadership, in fact, we have different philosophies of running universities. So let's focus on this topic on the uh, future, uh, 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 in the future to be a future project of us. And in fact, the idea of leadership of universities was one of the first topic approached by International Association of Universities, but in, uh, in a parallel discussion with autonomy. So let's speak about this in another session and be happy we just uh, concluded a session of one hour and 30 minutes to launch the book, uh, anniversary book of uh, International Association of Universities. 
I'm looking not daily, I have to recognize, but every other day I'm looking to see how many copies were downloaded and it's uh, going uh, up and up. And uh, that is good. That means the book is a book which uh, uh, um, academics or people outside academia would like to look uh, at. Thank you very much, uh, Hilich uh, and the Secretariat for organizing everything for today, looking forward for the next um, um, uh, session, launch session, and please, Hilich, as uh, our boss and colleague that we love, conclude this session. Maybe yeah. announce us uh, what will be the next steps. Well, thank you very much to you, Remus, for excellent chairing and also for supporting out of CNCPA this session. Uh, also for making the open access book possible and for supporting this specific uh, launch as well. So thank you very much for that. Also for having seconded Diana Camelia Yanku to the IAU. Uh, so that was wonderful to work with you here in Paris uh, for a short period of time would have been more if COVID would not have prevented us to do so. Uh, and thank you for all the speakers and the wonderful contributions uh, and, uh, and for the participants for having attended. We hope we will see many of you again on Thursday for uh, to continue the conversations because I feel that we just only started. That's always the frustration of a webinar. <laughs> you, you get to a point where you feel comfortable of ex in exchanging really, and then we don't have a coffee break or a, a glass of wine to, to, <laughs> to continue to rebuild a better world. So uh, we will have to wait for that just a little bit more, but at least we see each other uh, hopefully for those who can on Thursday, and then again for the book in particular on 9 December. In the yeah, meantime, yeah. Um, let's uh, let's work together uh, towards the, the future of higher education. Yes, Remus, you wanted yeah, to... Yeah, just to mention, Ponchai was with us, vice president of uh, uh, the association, and also uh, Pam Friedman, we are discussing with her, I think, uh, Friday. For yep. just uh, very objective reasons, she couldn't uh, participate today with us, but she's very happy. We have the book and she will join us at the at a future event. And definitely. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. So we continue and together and together around the world, we will continue to build a better society. No, that's the plan. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs> have a good day, evening, afternoon, wherever you are.